Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Beverly and I am an alcoholic. God, that sounds great. You know, I, um, I'm very proud to be here with you today and to tell you that I am a sober woman alcoholic. It's, it's a wonderful gift. <laughs> Through the grace of God, AA, and in spite of my sponsor, <laughs> I'm sober today since 1965. <laughs> Which reminds me, I wanted to thank Dick and Peggy Martin and the committee for the privilege of being here uh, with you today. I, uh, you know, I was I was looking at the uh, little program and it uh, was talking. It, it was saying that uh, uh, I would be speaking and that following me, uh, Mary, uh, our Al-Anon speaker, would be speaking. And it said, "Ladies of the afternoon." <laughs> Well, that's a step up. Hell, you know, some of us were ladies of the evening, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> I thought that was real good. But anyway, as uh, uh, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be here with you. And, uh, you know, uh, I left California, and it was like, uh, goodbye, God, I'm going to Nebraska, you know. <laughs> but, you know, he's here, too, and that's a wonderful feeling that no matter where I go, you know, there he is. And uh, that leads me into uh, the book here, because that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to share with you, uh, not tell you what you have to do. That's not what I'm here for, because I don't know exactly what you're going to have to do. But I'm going to share with you uh, the things that I have learned through the program, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, this is a book written by alcoholics, for alcoholics, about alcoholism and how the alcoholic is to stay sober. And that's what I'm going to tell you is, is, is the things that I've had to learn, the morals, the values, and the principles uh, that I found in taking the steps. <laughs> this was talked about a little earlier uh, last night. My husband touched on it again uh, this morning, and uh, I'm going to uh, continue on with that theme because, uh, to me, it's been very important. Uh, these are the steps that I took, and with you I'm going to share the principles that I have learned, that I have applied, that I have worked, that I continue to work in my daily life. And uh, that, to me, is is what I've had to learn to do. Now, uh, I don't know about y'all, but I didn't have too many um, positive-type principles uh, when I was drinking. Uh, and uh, I got into the book, and my husband talked about, you know, uh, that we alcoholics are backwards. Well, I'm going to start with a 12th step <laughs> and work it <laughs> that way. Uh, isn't that the way we always do is we start with the back of the book first, you know, and, and then, you know, sort of get in the middle of it and then go both directions at the same time. Story of an alcoholic. Uh, but anyway, uh, in, in that 12th step, it says, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all of our affairs, in all of our affairs. And I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, and, and I have to tell you, I have a couple of real pet peeves uh, if, if when I hear some people talking, and I'm going to share one of them with you here today. And that is I hear people in meetings and at podiums like this, you know, sharing with you, and they say something like this. Well, you can just work this program any way you want to. Well, now, I don't know what the hell book they're reading, but they're not reading the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous because that's not what it says at all. And let me tell you what it says. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. There's no S on path. You can't take a whole bunch of different paths. <laughs> Thoroughly followed our path. 
Well, I don't know about you, but when I got here, you know, I knew all the answers. God, you know, I wasn't dumb. It was the questions I didn't know. <laughs> and, you know, and, and I was I was so scared that if I just didn't get everything just right, I was going to get drunk. I mean, I was really terrified. Fear and pain's always been my strongest motivator, drunk or sober. You know, fear of pain will motivate me into taking some kind of action. And so, you know how we get sometimes, you know, uh, we get real upset, you know, get emotionally upset, and, and we just know we're going to get drunk. So we do what we've been taught to do, and that's to call our sponsor, right? And I called my sponsor because I was so afraid because I didn't understand exactly what that was saying. And, uh, you know, so I, I called her up uh, and, and just was, blah, 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 you know how we get. And, blah, 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 and she listened to me for a minute or two. And then she said, honey, she said, read the book, the answers in the book. Have you ever had them do that to you? You just want to let them have it. <laughs> You know, you're running around flying up your own ass. You just know you're going to get drunk. Y'all do that here too, huh? Okay. And they're telling you to read the book. Well, if you're new in here, let me tell you why they tell you to read the book. They know the answers are in the book. They just don't know where they're at. So they got you reading the whole book. Aren't they sneaky as heck, you know? Anyway, so I went back because I didn't understand what path they were talking about. And this is what I found in the book when I went back and started reading it. It said, a lack of power is our dilemma. And to find this power greater than ourselves that will solve our problem is exactly what this book is all about. Now, I know that some of you didn't hear that. And I know there's some of you here that don't want to hear that. So watch my lips. I'm going to repeat it, okay? Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. A lack of power is our dilemma. And to find this power greater than ourselves that will solve our problem is exactly what this book is all about. Now, then it went right on after that, and it says, We have written a book which we believe to be spiritual as well as moral. Well, God, when they used that word moral, I thought, <laughs> What are my morals? <laughs> Did you ever think about that? I never had before. I mean, I just sort of took them for granted and did whatever came first, you know, whichever one he was. <laughs> well, here I am, you know. Now, I, I'm scared again, and I'm thinking, you know, well, what are my morals? I, you know, I didn't know. Because, you see, I don't believe that my drunkenness was a moral issue. I have come to believe that my sobriety is. So, therefore, it behooved me to find out what my morals were. It behooved me to find out what my morals were, and I have never thought about it before. You know, if y'all have a little tr uh, trouble uh, understanding me, uh, I know there's some people here that talk like me. You know, they tell me at home I don't speak English. I speak Southern. So if, if there's a little trouble here, you'll understand why. Uh, anyway, I, uh, I started going to meetings, and I started listening, and I began to hear uh, talk like uh, the three essentials of how this program works. Well, God, y'all had a whole new language here that I didn't understand. But again, I got back in the book, you know, and, and uh, I had heard the three essentials were honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. And I thought, now what the heck is that all about? But again, I got back into the book, and I started studying it, and this is what I found. Honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. In taking the first step, when I admitted I was powerless over alcohol, that my life had become unmanageable, you know, I, I, I began to wonder about that, as, as to what that meant. Because, you see, I had never been able to stop drinking. I had got into a drunken world of which I almost didn't find my way back into the real world. And I, in looking back in, in, at the people I knew that loved me and that dared get close enough to me, and the people that I loved the most, I was unkind to, and very disruptive in their life. Destructive would be a better word. And then it was the next day 
you know, of waking up with that feelingness of remorse and hopelessness of the things that I had done. There is no words that I have ever been able to find as an alcoholic to tell anyone of the loneliness and the despair that I felt when I wanted to quit drinking, so desperately wanted to quit drinking, and I couldn't. But you see, here with you people, I found the words, and I really didn't need the words with y'all because you understood where I was. I went into that first step, and when I was able to truly admit that I was powerless over alcohol, and I think that we call it surrender. God, I hated that word because that's just the beginning of the surrenders. And when I was truly able to admit my powerlessness, there somehow came a strength in me as far as alcohol was concerned that I had never, ever had before. And I was able to set aside the juice. So you see, just in admitting that I was powerless, in being honest for the first time as far as alcohol was concerned, that strength came to me and, and I just quit. I was one of those that was very fortunate when I when I finally got here to you people. I had no more fight left in me. And when you told me what to do, God, was I ever willing to do it. Uh, and I didn't even know I was alcoholic when I got here, but that's going to be part of my story tomorrow night. Uh, but when I found out I was, you know, God, what a relief that was. What a relief. And all I had to do was just be honest with you and say, yeah, I'm an alcoholic. And, you know, that was the longest journey in the shortest space of time that I have ever been on in my life when I was able to do that. Going, if you will, from the intellect to the spirit, from the head to the heart. So now I had the principle of honesty. Honesty is a principle. Now, a principle to me is the way I live my life on a daily basis. That's the action that I take. That's the principle that I'm living by that day. And that's what I'm talking about, morals, values, and principles. And I run them all together because they mean very much the same thing to me. A value is something that I hold in high esteem, and I hold the actions that I take on a daily basis in very high esteem. And there I went from that into the second step where I came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. I had no trouble with that when I know that some people do. But you see, I had come out of a nut house three and a half years earlier, and I had a certificate proven that I was insane. <laughs> so, you know, it was no problem. Now, you know, what I didn't understand was what kind of insanity that they were talking about here in the program because they weren't talking about the same kind that they were talking about in the nut house. And I have come to believe, and as I understand the book, and remember, I'm not telling anybody else what they have to do or what they believe. I'm only telling you what I've learned from here and the things I've had to apply. And anyway, the insanity I believe and understand that the book's talking about is that insanity of the alcoholic mind, the thinking that an alcoholic has preceding the first drink. And that's the reason they tell you when you get sober in here and you start thinking, for God's sake, don't do it. Don't do your own thinking until you're well enough to do it. That's the reason we have sponsors. Now, that doesn't mean that they tell you what color of toilet paper to use, you know, or call me today at two minutes after four or you're fired. Uh, I don't know where all this BS comes from, but it's not AA as I know it, okay? My sponsor uh, told me, she said, I'm here to tell you what's in the book to help you to learn how to apply it to your life, the things that you need to know in order for you to stay sober. And that's what sponsorship was all about. Anyway, as I went into that second step, I began to hear the word spiritual. Well, I'm assuming that a lot of y'all are like I was. When I heard that, I connected immediately with religion. And I said, you know, no, 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 no. Yeah, that does not work. 
I have tried that. I've gone to Baptist church, Methodist church, Pentecostal church, Mormon churches, even went to the Jewish temple, you know, and and beside that, there are too many Catholic priests and, and men of the cloth and nuns. I hear, I understand we're going to have one of those little nunny bunnies here pretty soon on Sunday. <laughs> you know, and I knew that, you know, religion didn't work. And anyway, uh, my sponsor said, honey, she said, will you stop assuming things? She said, do you know what the word spiritual means? And I said, well, it means you go to church and, and you pray to God and, and all those things. And I said, that doesn't work. I tried it. And she said, why don't you learn to use a dictionary and get into a dictionary? So I did. I looked up the word spiritual and spirituality. And this is what I found that worked for me. It said, being spiritual is simply an elevation of thought and feeling. How about that? Took it right out of the religious context for me. For me. And took it right into the world of, of practical. And that was what I needed then. That was what I needed. Because all my life I've lived off of my emotions. And if you're in here and you think you're going to stay, you know, get emotionally well and, and stay sober that way, I got news for you. You're going to be in for one hell of a ride, you know. Uh, in fact, any of you, you know, my husband doesn't think I've got emotionally well yet. You know, and, and I may never get emotionally well, and that's okay with me because I'm sure having a hell of a lot of fun in the meantime, you know. <laughs> but it took it right out of that. And, you know, from the kind of a drunken woman I was, the minute I set aside the juice, I automatically had an elevation of thought and feeling. I mean, it just happened. I didn't have to do anything, you know. So there I was. Now, it says that we don't have to buy all of this at one time. You ain't got to believe in God at one time. In fact, you know that this program will work for those who do believe in God. And it will work for those who don't believe in God. And it will even work for those who think they are God, won't it? Honey? <laughs> It says all we have to do at this point in our sobriety is just keep an open mind. How about that? All we have to do is just keep an open mind at this time. So now I've got honesty and open-mindedness. Now, it says that these two steps are very basic steps. They are the foundation of our program. So we're, we're building now. We've, we've got our foundation. And then I went into the third step where it said to make a decision to turn my life and my will over to the care of God as I understood him. How about that? I didn't understand him at all. And beside that, I was real iffy with this God thing. I wasn't even sure there was a God. And then remember I told you fear and pain was my strongest motivators? I remembered something that I had read somewhere as a kid, and it went something like this. I would rather live my life as though there was a God and die and find out that there wasn't than to live my life as though there was no God and then die and find out that there was. Now, I don't know about you, but that scared the hell out of me, you know, and I decided to real quickly act as if. And I had got real confused with that because when I got here, my sponsor had told me, she said, Deborah, you were a phony when you were out there drinking. And now, by gosh, that you're in AA, you're going to stop being a phony and you're going to tell it like it is. And when I told you people I wasn't sure there was a God and I was real iffy on that thing, you said, that's okay, honey. You just, you know, uh, act as if. Well, now I got a little confused with that because she's saying, you know, you stop being a phony and you're telling me to act as if. But I'm telling you, when I when I remember that little saying, I decided real quick I was going to act as if. Now, in that step, in that third step, it tells us that that step is our keystone. This book kept using words that I didn't understand. I had to continuously go to a dictionary when I got here. In fact, you know, I'm still doing that today. But, you know, uh, keystone, what in the world is that? Well, they, they, the, the uh, dictionary told me that a keystone is the stone which everything else is built around. Which everything else is built around. And you see, it is with this step that we walk through the archway of freedom. The freedom from the bondage of self. Because now we've, you know, we've, we have found a power greater than ourself. Or at least we've, we've started on that road, on that path that the book talks about. 
our very lives and our program depend upon how well we apply this step, how well that we bring this step in and apply it to our life. So now I've got the principle of willingness. I've now got the principle of willingness. It says that any life built on self-will can hardly be a success. So now I've got a new boss. Got a new boss now, a new director. And it says he'll provide for us what we need if we stay close to him and do his work well. If we stay close to him, he'll provide everything that we need. Not always what we want, as most of us know. But what we need. And God knows I got what I needed. <laughs> Sorry to hear that. Anyway, and he keeps telling me I got what I deserved. <laughs> but then you know that works the other way, too. He got what he deserved. And I'll tell you more about that tomorrow night. Anyway, there I am in this third step, and I now have the willingness. Now, the second step is connected to this third step, our basic, and any steps thereafter are connected to this step. And if we do not do this step well, when the doo-doo hits the sand, our whole program is going to crumble. I cleaned that up real good, didn't I? <laughs> it, it'll just fall apart. This step is one of the most important steps. If we could pick out one, it would be mine, that the program has to offer. Made a decision to turn my life and my will over to the care of God as I understood it. I didn't even have to understand him. I just went ahead and turned it over anyway because the other way was no good for me. I was dying behind my other way of life. So now I've got the three essentials, honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. I can't, he can, so let him. And I was certainly willing to do that. Now I am ready for my fourth step. And in my fourth step, I'm going to find the principle of truth. Because in that fourth step, when we take that searching, fearless, moral, oh God, I hated that word every time I heard it, you know, inventory, I faced and found the errors that I had made in my life. You know, not, not the characteristic was not what I had to change. That was not what I was looking for. Because basically I am still what I was. But I began to seek out and find the flaws, the defects in that character. And I did this through this moral inventory. So I began to live the principle of truth in my life. And from there, I went into my fifth step. Now, that one was really a doozy because it says as soon as you take your fourth, you know, you go over into your fifth. And I got to tell you, I did not trust this sponsor that I had. She was a real whip. I started to say something else, but she was... <laughs> She was a real whip, I kid you not. And I didn't trust her at all. And I knew when I went to her to, t to take this moral inventory that she was going to ask me to leave her house. And not only was she going to ask me to leave her house, but she was going to come here to AA and tell all you people what I had told her. And then you were going to ask me to leave AA, you know, and, and I was really scared. Now, in this step, you know, when, when we, t you know, uh, tell this, this inventory to them, it says, you know, that we cannot omit anything. That we go and we tell one person all of our life story, omitting nothing. For if we do, we may not overcome drinking. That scared me. And then, right after that, it said, almost invariably, we drank again. Well, now, I don't know what that does for you, but it scared the hell out of me one more time. And again, you know, I have to go back. I did not have any trust in this sponsor at all. But by this time, you see what had begun to happen was is that I began to have a trust in and a belief in this power greater than myself. 
And again, I had gone back into the book because I was so unwilling to do this. And in the book, I found another answer. And this is what I found that it said in there. It said, cling to the thought that in God's hands, our darkest past is the greatest possession we have. For it is the key to life and happiness. And with that key, we avert death and misery for others. Can you imagine that? The worst thing that we've done is going to be a key to life and happiness to our very lives. And not only that, it's going to avert death and misery for others. And this is how it came about in my life when I was able to apply that. Because as I said, you know, I had come to trust in this power. Not in people places or things, but in this power now. And I went to this sponsor of mine, and I told her all of my life story, omitting nothing, to the very best of my ability. And she looked at me and laughed, and she said, don't worry, honey, I've done that in spades. (laughs) God, what a relief, you know. But she shared a part of her story with me at that time. And in sharing, you know, isn't that love? Because that's what developed I learned to love my sponsor, and she in turn loved me, and we shared with each other. And isn't love God? And isn't God spiritual? And isn't that what the whole program of Alcoholics Anonymous is all about? A lack of power is our dilemma. And to find this power greater than ourself that will solve our problems is what it's all about. Now, I went from there, and it said, you know, to keep moving on at this point. And I went into my sixth step. And in that sixth step, I began to learn the principle of faith. Because, you see, it said faith without works is dead. So, you know, we can trust all we want to, but if we don't have the faith and and, and put them together, it's just it, it wasn't working for them. And that was the reason it wasn't working, because I hadn't got over into my sixth step, and I had to get a hold of that faith. And it said in there that, you know, I was entirely ready to have God remove all of these defects of character. And I thought, God, what an order. I can't go through with it, you know. Uh, if, I, if he removes them all, there ain't going to be nothing left, you know. I was scared one more time, fear and pain back in my life. What's going to be left if he, if he just takes them all? And, you know, and we used to hear this talked about a lot, you know, and they, and they use the expression, you, you're peeling the grape or you're, you're peeling the onion, you know, and, and you get the damn thing peeled and there just ain't nothing left there. And that's what I thought I was going to be when I was trying to get ready for this entirely ready, you know, all my defects. I mean, really? Can I just do a little at a time as we go along? Well, yeah, you know. But you just don't do your seventh until you, you're ready, until you surrender. All of them. All of them. So I finally, you know, worked around that. And I kept working on that principle until I was entirely ready. Until I could have the faith that I needed to have them all removed as best I knew them. And I had learned about them back in that four step, remember? I learned what my defects were back there. I'd taken that moral inventory. And remember, and it said that we were willing to go to any length for victory over alcohol. Any length. So I said, okay, God. And I knelt down in prayer, and I humbly asked him to remove my shortcomings. To remove them. And in doing so, I had to get the courage to do it. So there I had another principle, the principle of courage. And you know, I used to to go to the dentist. I used to. Hell, I still am. And I got all my teeth. I'm not like some people I know. (laughs) They keep talking about women taking off all their parts. (laughs) (laughs) Haven't had to remove any yet. Anyway, uh, there, there I was. Forgot where I was. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm trying now to muster up the courage, you know, the, the the courage to, to have all of these removed. And, uh, and I did. I got the courage to do this. And as I said, when I was walking into a dentist office, I was scared as hell. 
that God <laughs> was I brave coming out. <laughs> you know, it was all over, and I was as brave as heck. And if you ask me if I was brave, how could you go to a dentist? I have I have to have uh, I can't take any Novocaine or anything like that when I go to a dentist. I'm allergic to it, and I don't like to be put to sleep. And I <laughs> have to have a root canal done every once in a while. And uh, uh, you know and and I and I go in there and I have a root canal done with no no anesthetic at all. You know, yeah, that's what that's what I said. People say to me, <laughs> well, that's putting it a little mild as to what I said. But they say, well, God, how can you do that? You must be so brave. <laughs> no, no, I'm scared to death. But you see, I'm more scared of having an allergy reaction to uh, the the Novocaine and stuff. I'm, I'm scared I'm going to die, and uh, so I. I have to go in there with a little bit of courage. So with it, with the help of this power greater than myself, and and what I really do, people say, well, what do you do when you're in there and you're having that done with no anesthetic? I pray like hell. It's <laughs> exactly what I do. And when I come out of there, my husband says, oh God, he said, I don't know how you do it, and I feel so brave and courageous, you know. And that's where I got my courage from, you know. And that's where I learned that that seven step you know, uh, works, and that's where I, I practice the principle of courage. And now, now I'm ready to go over into my eighth step. I've had all my defects removed. I've got my moral inventory taken. And back there when I was taking that moral inventory, I had made a list, and, and in my particular case, it was only a partial list, but I did the best I could at that time. And I had this list, but by now, you know, I'm sober and, and, and my mind's gotten a little bit clearer and, and I've added a few more to the list as I've been going along now of the people that I've harmed because uh, uh, it's it's coming up now. And I, and I know what comes after step eight. I've been around long enough to know that what I'm going to have to do. And I got all this list ready of all the people I've harmed and uh, I'm, I'm ready now. Uh, I've... I've uh, Assumed, assumed the responsibility now of, of getting that list together. And I've got myself ready, and now I'm going to go into step nine. So now I've got the principle there. And in step nine, I've got to use a little self-discipline here. And also remember now I've got this power, so now I've got the strength to do what's necessary to make these amends to all people wherever possible, except when to do so will injure them and others. So I've got the discipline to do it with now. That's one of my principles I found there. And I've also found strength, the principle of strength. And that strength does not come from within me no more than it is when I go to a dentist. It comes from this power greater than myself that I've learned to have trust in, trust and faith in, trust and faith. And so now I begin. And I have now taken my ninth step. Now, from that point on, it tells us that, you know, that if, if we have done our work well, it gives us the promises that we hear so much about in AA. Uh, you know, of, of the 12 promises, I think, that, that the people talk about them at the bottom of page 83 and 84. So now I'm going to go into step 10. And in step 10, I learned the principle of acceptance, of acceptance. I have now begun to accept this program as a way of life. And in order to continue on with this way of life, I have accepted the fact that I'm going to have to continue to take inventory. I'm going to have to continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fears. Because by now, it says, we have ceased fighting anything or anyone. Well, almost. <laughs> I never claimed to be perfect. The <laughs> book says we try and practice these principles in all of our affairs, right? didn't say we didn't perfect. We just progress. We get a little bit better. Sometimes a little worse. In some cases... You know, he he keeps calling my babies Bev's bitches. You know, but 
you know, uh, I don't tell him what he calls them, uh, but I do tell him this. Honey, if you don't learn what you need to learn with me, I'm going to turn you over to him. And, you know, they get renewed in this program with a vigor that they've never been able to muster before. It's amazing, you know, what some words will do for us. Anyway, it says, by now we have ceased fighting anything or anyone. For sanity will have returned. And remember, we're talking about the insanity of the alcoholic mind preceding the first drink. We've even stopped fighting alcohol. We've even stopped fighting alcohol. And we now have no problem with it. No problem at all. I'm now getting ready to go in to step. 11. And in step 11, the principle that I had learned there was the principle of unselfishness. Because you see, the book told me, and I have come to believe, I keep coming to believe, I'm telling you all these things that I had to keep learning. And I want y'all to know that I have not been able to do this stuff overnight. Uh, and in a couple more weeks, I'm going to be 25 years sober. And, um, Great, I, I love it. They keep saying I don't say this to impress anyone, but it sure impresses me. Well, <laughs> when you get to be 25 years sober, you better believe it. You better believe it. Every day impresses me when I can get up sober and go to bed sober, because that's what it's all about. Is no matter how long I am sober, I am only one drink away from a drunk, you know. And this drunk has to continue to remember that. Uh, along with a few other things that you've taught me here on this program. And anyway, here I am now, and I've, I've got to, to, to learn how to be unselfish in this 11th step. Unselfish and dedicated. Well, dedicated to what? Dedicated to this program. Because you see, I owe it my life. I was dying when I was out there. And that is another pet peeve I have. When I hear people in meetings and at podiums like this saying words like this, well, today I no longer have a drinking problem. Today I just have a living problem. God, if you hear somebody saying something like that and you are an alcoholic of my kind, run, run. You damn right I've got a living problem today. Hell, I am alive. I am alive. You know, do you know of anybody that's alive? I don't care. You don't have to be an alcoholic that doesn't have a living problem. The day this drunk ever forgets that I come darn near dying from alcohol, not from living problems. Hell, I used to think like that when I was drunk. I almost died from drinking alcohol. Not from living problems. The day this drunk ever forgets it, I'm liable to be back on that juice again. You know, if anybody says that to you, run away from them, for God's sake. They'll kill you. They'll kill you if you start thinking that, you know, that your living problem is your problem. It's just liable to get back on the juice again. And I never want to do that. Not if I want to continue to live. And I like living. I really like living. And I like the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I love to share about the program of alcohol numbers. I used to think, you know, God, you know, is it ever, you know, uh, the day is going to come, you know, when I'm going to get bored, when I'm going to get bored. And I'm here to tell you I ain't been bored yet. You know, there is too many wonderful, exciting things going on here. I am living life today, and Lord, do I love it. Do I love it. Anyway, I'm in here now, and I'm on the principles that I've learned in the 11th step, the principles of unselfishness, unselfishness, and devotion, and devotion. Continue prayer and meditation. Continued prayer and meditation. And what was it? Was it 
I can't remember whether it was Bill or Bob, you know, and, and, and they were talking about, uh, you know, working with others, working with others. And the unselfishness, love and service, you know, that's, that's what keeps us dry. Dr. Bob said that. And I have certainly found it to be true. Love, love and service. And that's what I found in 10, 11, and 12. The acceptance of this is a way of life in order for this drunk to stay sober. The service and the love that I have and continued prayer and meditation of continuing to seek out the things that I do that are wrong in my life on a daily basis now. I've cleaned up the wreckage of my past, and now I am living on a daily basis, one day at a time, I think it's called here in this program. And in this, on this daily basis, because, you know, I, I, I hear, and again, uh, uh, Hank and uh, Hugh both touched on it in their talks, of uh, we are more than a hundred men and women, this was in the original book, uh, of men who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. Well, you know, I didn't know what that meant, you know. And again, I got back in the dictionary. What does the word recovered mean? <laughs> and I was so tickled when I got in there. You know what it said recovered means? Well, it gave a very practical sense in the sense of, uh, of, of, of an illness. You know, it said that uh, we regain our health and we get back in control, you know, of, of, of our health and our lives. And then the one that I just dearly love, it says that, that here we, uh, we, how did it word it? it where we, we don't stumble and we don't slip. You know, we're we are we're safe from slipping and stumbling now. That is recovered. We you know I thought how apropos, you know, how many people get in here and they stay sober for a little while and then they have what they call a slip. And here now we're talking about recovery and we're men and women who have recovered. So now we we don't slip anymore and we don't stumble. We don't drink. And we apply the principles that we've learned here, each one of us in our own way, and the own principles, because these are not the only principles here in these, in these steps. You know, there's, you'll each find your own. And there's more than one. I have found many more than one. Um, and I have found it uh, <laughs> a little hard to talk to you today about the principles, you know, of my recovery, because uh, I, I usually talk about this in a workshop, and when I do, I tell my story as I go along so that you'll see where, uh, where I've learned the principle, where it's been necessary for this drunk to learn that particular principle in order for me to stay sober, to stop doing the things that I had been doing that kept getting me drunk, you know, and uh, that was where the trouble was, because I kept wanting to do what I had been doing and stay sober, <laughs> and I couldn't do that. You know, and, and, and my sponsor kept saying to me, she said, uh, stop doing what you're doing. And I kept saying, but I want to do that. You know, I want to do what I'm doing. And she'd say, no, stop doing what you're doing. Well, that was totally unacceptable. You know, uh, I, I wanted her to tell me something else beside that. And she just never did. And anyway, I'm, uh, I'm perfectly willing at this time, not only willing, but anxious uh, you know, to, to do whatever is necessary in order for me to stay sober. I'm willing to go to any length over victory, over alcohol. Now, here I am, and I'm using the word recovered because I believe today that I am a recovered alcoholic. Well, now, in the book, you know, back there, it tells us that we are never cured from alcoholism. Is that what recovered means, is that I'm cured for alcoholism? The book says that I'm not cured. It says that what I have is a daily reprieve contingent upon my spiritual condition. Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. Well, I'm thinking that, good gosh, you know, what, uh, what am I going to do with that? Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. 
Does that mean I'm always going to be sick? I hate that word. You know, and another word I hate is the word disease. Our book doesn't tell us that alcoholism is a disease. There is nowhere in the textbook, and I'm talking about the first 164 pages, that it uses the word disease except in one place, and it does not use it in the context with alcoholism. It tells us that as alcoholics, it calls it an illness, it calls it an affliction, and it calls it a malady. And the only place that the word disease is used that I am aware of, and I could be wrong, hell, I've been wrong before, have a honey, yeah. <laughs> Not as often as he is, though, i got to tell you that. <laughs> I mean, this is an honest program. <laughs> and where it uses the word disease, it says, and it's talking about resentment, talking about resentments. It says we can't afford resentments. It doesn't say we don't get them. <laughs> we just can't afford to keep them. So we do something, you know, to get rid of them. And in there, it said, when the spiritual malady is overcome, then we straighten out physically and mentally. When the spiritual malady is overcome. And it said, from resentment stem all forms of spiritual disease. Not alcoholism, but from resentment stem all forms of spiritual disease. So all we had to do then was overcome the spiritual malady that we had. Okay. And it also told me in that book, in working with others, I'm now at step 12, and love and service. Service is what I learned as a principle in step 12. And that in working with others to impress upon our man that he is spiritually sick, that he has an illness, a fatal malady. We do not have a bad habit. A lot of people seem to think we do. It's not a bad habit. It is a fatal malady. It will kill us, as many of us know. I damn near died from drinking alcohol, and I could not stop. I could not until I got here to you people, and you told me that you had found a way, a way out of a living hell, and that you would tell me and share with me how you had done it. And God, I was so grateful. I was so grateful. And now I am working with a sick alcoholic. I'm working with some that are not so sick. We're getting a lot of people in here that have never reached the acute and chronic stages of alcoholism that some of us have. But, you know, what are we going to do? Wait until we do get to that stage, you know, before we reach out and give help? I think not. I think not. At least that's not a principle that I've learned here in Alcoholics Anonymous. But the one thing that we do have is that we work with alcoholics. It said carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all of our affairs. These principles. And I have shared with you some of the principles that I have had to learn and that I try and practice in my daily life. The things that I have come to value in my way of life. I, um, I really hope that what I have brought here to you today is two of the greatest commandments that were given to us. And I also like to read that not approved book <laughs> by World Service. Uh, I, I have found a lot of good answers in that, and uh, uh, I'll share a part of that with you, too, on, on Saturday. Um, but those two commandments were to love thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and all thy mind. And to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Because you see, we are our brother's keepers. Like it or not, we are our brother's keeper. And I thank you ever so much 
for the privilege of being here and sharing with you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.